I'm going to speak about two kind of um, kind of vague ideas, um, two topics that a lot of people aren't necessarily fully familiar with. Um, and what I want to speak about is I want to speak about finding your flow during the difficult years. So finding your flow through the difficult years, this is going to be something I'm going to speak about a good bit here. Um, one of them is this idea of flow. Flow is an idea that Mihai Cheeks and Mihai came up with uh, in the early 1980s. He was a psychologist who studied this, this phenomena that artists and greats and masters all try to, try to work with, and they all said that they, they experienced. And flow is, very simply put, this act when you are doing something that you are great at, that you're decent at, that you're learning how to do, where you achieve this kind of state of transcendence, where your mind and body almost slip away, and the act that you're doing um, becomes almost almost magical. Uh, there's an ecstatic flow to it, an energy to it. He, he describes it in this graph here. Um, this is the only flow chart I've ever made. Um, and uh, this is his graph specifically. So it's basically looking at the challenge level of the tasks that you're doing versus your skill level. And effectively, when you find a nice conjunction of those two things, that's when you start to flow. And it's something that I think is most easily described by Poi. So this is one of many toys that are used as a flow art. Um, the art form itself is meant to derive flow. And so it's easiest to, it's, it's easiest to describe by doing what's called an anti-spin flower. This looks very complex, but... When you're learning it, you're taught to just do this. And this is a lesson that's, that kind of carries through with everything in life. When we're learning, we always take what seems to be the hardest path to our end result, to our goal. But once we start to take some time to learn, we can have some beauty in the movement of life. And that's flow. The difficult years... <clears throat> Those are another topic completely. The difficult years you know, are described by Robert Greene's book, Mastery, as a largely self-directed apprenticeship that lasts some five to 10 years and receives little attention because it does not contain stories of great achievement or discovery. When we speak of the difficult years, we're speaking of the time that Marie Curie spent in poverty before any discoveries. We're speaking of the time Enrico Fermi uh, spent as a lab assistant not being allowed to do any experiments of his own. We're speaking of the time that da Vinci spent between his first commission, of which he did not complete, to the 16 years later when he finally com uh, completed the work on The Last Supper. It's something that's a very challenging thing to deal with in our modern society. Most of us are taught that we're supposed to speed through life. We're supposed to achieve a mastery, achieve our desired career goals by the time we're 30. That's not enough time to put in 10,000 hours on anything. If you consider that most of us leave high school at around 18, our, our time that we spend to achieve mastery, that 10,000 hours, which most people think takes about a minimum of 10 years to achieve, that means even if we know exactly what we want to do, when we are done with school, at best, at very, very best, we will achieve mastery at something at 28. That's simply not reasonable. How many people actually understand what they want to do at such a young age? I knew I wanted to be an animator from the age of three, and yet that's still something I've never achieved. With all my hard work and effort, it's something that I've never achieved a mastery in. And so... Adam Westbrook, he wrote this amazing essay, video essay, called The Long Game, which I've referenced a number of times already in my talk. And he postulates this idea. The thing that connects all these great people, they played the long game. And he's speaking of this idea that they had a loose plan in their life. And they took the time to continue to push forward through this long game, to study, to dabble, to play, to experiment in what they did to achieve a mastery and then to execute that mastery. All of us have the brains and the talent and the creativity to join them. But now, right when it matters, do any of us have the patience? Think about that for a second. We are approaching a number of singularities that will happen in our lifetime. 
that will change exactly how every single one of us interacts with each other and with our planet. Are any of us willing to make the changes to make this a place worth living? So, for me, my personal story was that it's very similar to most people. Uh, I was disenfranchised with my job. Uh, I was not very happy. I had lived the life of someone else up until my late 20s. And it was something that I never fully understood the scope and direction of how I could apply change to my day-to-day -day life and how I was kind of working within the systems that I opposed. Um, and it was mostly just a pressure to achieve something by the time I was 30. I found myself almost feeling like I was falling behind. Uh, my career hadn't seen the growth that I expected it to when I was in high school and everyone told me that this was going to be a really important time of my life. Um, I didn't see those, those kind of prosperity gains I was told about uh, when I was in college. Um, and to be, simp to be very plain, the economy that existed in the 80s and 90s didn't exist in the 2000s. There wasn't much growth for my generation to see in the first place. And when I was in my mid-20s, I bought an enormous Da Vinci tome. This, this giant, giant, giant book. It was maybe this big, weighed about 40 pounds. And when you flip through this tome, it has a lifetime of sketches, of science, of research, of engineering, of cartography. Uh, the man's a doctor and an artist. But when you look back at that in your mid-20s, his lifetime of work seems insurmountable. Um, the amount that he did in that time frame seems so terrifying until you think back and you notice that at 28, Da Vinci wanted to kill himself. This is the work. This is one of his handful of commissions that he did during the time, St. Jerome in the Wilderness. And one thing you'll notice is that's not finished. He didn't finish anything. Da Vinci dreamed bigger than he could produce. He consistently, over and over and over again, did not finish any of his projects. So that left me lost and wondering about this. When I was about 28, the summer of 2008, um, we had a huge production with a very large corporation. The economy crashed, the production went away, and I decided to go to Burning Man. The reason why I reference Burning Man here is this was the first time in my life where I was able to see people building the world they envisioned. This was a place in the middle of nowhere where everyone took the time to create the world as they saw it. They didn't make excuses. They didn't stand back and say, this is established, so therefore I'm going to follow it. I'm going to chase it down. They said, this is a blank slate. I'm going to build what I want to build. <clears throat> and that left me inspired. However, when I came back, I had no job. I applied for 191 jobs in a period of 19 months. I got two callbacks. Think about that. 191 jobs. Nothing. What do you do? For me, it was about whether I go to film school or whether I make a film. I decided to make a film. I sold everything I owned, and I started traveling. I went to the Philippines, Southeast Asia, Kenya, visited my sister in London, and came home. And what happened was I was able to experience a new kind of life, a new perspective on how we live. <clears throat> this is just a man in Bali who we met at a little shack uh, smoking a cigarette. But was, what was important about traveling was I was able to see what people were able to find uh, within themselves. With very little, they were able to be happy, they were able to retain the happiness, they were still able to produce and build and create and make a life that was much more interesting than this hard scrabble existence that we expect people to live in outside of America. I included this monkey with her kid just because this was, this was a chance to see another creature looking at their reflection in my camera, reflecting upon themselves and possibly their existence. 
And this girl just simply showed me that maybe there was a completely different road to life that we could hoe forward. I also learned about flow while I was traveling. Um, this is when I learned poi. And the whole nature of flow, this idea that throughout your day-to-day -day life, everything you do, at some point you can achieve a flow to it. And this made me start to think, how does the act of flowing combine with the time you need to spend to achieve mastery? That time that you, that time that you build upon skills, that time that it almost seems unbearable to practice the guitar again, that time where you write and write and write and write and write, but the narrative never seems to come until suddenly you explode forth and the chapters appear on the page. I met Sam in uh, Kenya. Sam was an orphan. And at the time, I'd lost my belt. My pants kept falling down. And Sam kept trying to give me a belt. And I said, Sam, I can't take your belt. And he said, why can't you take my belt? And I looked at him, I said, well, you're an orphan. You need your belt. And he looked at me and he said, Matt, your pants are falling down. I have two belts. Are you not going to take a belt from me because I'm an orphan? And that sunk in fairly deeply with me. This perspective of everyone has something to give. Everyone has something to share. We all participate in this journey together, and we're always in the difficult years. I think something that's very easy to forget is, or really never know, is that once you achieve greatness, what do you do after greatness? You have to do something. It's still difficult. You just have to be great after you were great, which is even harder. So this was part of my journey, and this is a personal part of my journey as, as I continue through what I call the difficult years. Um, first, I learned to meditate, and I hate it. It drives me nuts. I do not want to sit down and stare at a wall for hours on end. Um, meditation to me is the ability to focus in this moment. It's the ability to stand up in front of 300 peers and look around and be calm and find a point and meaning to the presence in this moment. Um, I learned to hug. Uh, I was never very physical with people. Learning to hug and accept physical, physical affection was very important to that mental growth. Traveling opened up this idea of dabbling and playing and experimenting with my ideas. Play opened up the ability to refine those ideas. You dabble, then you play, then you attain mastery. In collaboration, this was a lesson that I learned about three years ago. This was a pier in Penang Island in Southeast Asia. Um, and this pier itself was this rickety old monster that went out into the ocean with seven foot long giant lizards swimming around that looked like they were going to eat. It was absolutely terrifying. So we reproduced it at Burning Man. This was our first attempt at mastery. This was our first attempt at trying to do something really incredible. This took 22 friends with no money, myself with no job, an enormous amount of passion to build. And that was it. So, I mean, really, that was it. We had nothing. We just got 22 of us together and we built something. And one of my favorite, favorite memories of this piece was I was walking out from the distance and the dust was kicking up and I saw this, this killer whale just appear out of the dust and drop back down. And then I saw a giant shark come up and drop back down. And as I approached, I realized that it was a group of people flying two 30-foot kites. Um, they were flying these two beautiful kites at the end of the pier, and there were about 100 people staring, watching this kind of dance of the ocean. It was really, really incredible. And that... That inspiration, that charge, um, that response pushed us forward. That pushed us to do better, to be better. And that also allowed us to kind of refine what our message was. So when, when I speak about trying to find a flow through the difficult years, ultimately what you need to do is you need to find what you want to drive yourself to and then try to learn to spend time to refine that drive. And so for me, I think it's easiest to explain as you want to dabble, explore, experiment, meditate, study, refine, and repeat. Dabble. Play with those ideas that you want to refine. See what you like. When you find something that you, you kind of gravitate towards, something that pulls you, 
Explore with it. Experiment with it. Meditate on the idea. Study it. Refine it. And then repeat. It's just the constant act of getting better and establishing the skills so that when you have a chance to achieve greatness, you can chase it down. You can grab it from the air and take advantage of it. This is what we did when that chance finally came. We took that pier and we added a 90-foot full-scale Spanish galleon. It had over a 1,000 props. Over 200 people helped us work on it. A four-year timeline, shot fire. Uh, it was three stories tall. It was quite incredible. And that opened up a huge amount of doors for my entire group in our life. This ship helped us, helped us establish the generator, which is a 34,000 square foot maker space in Reno. Uh, it's free to everyone to use. And it's based on this idea that everyone comes and gives to the space and they give back to each other. And from there we can start a new learning paradigm or continue it as Sugata Mitra spoke of when he proposed the idea of self-organized learning environments. We simply want to take his idea and expand it to the adult realm, where all of us can take and share our skills together so we can all chase down doing something great. This story doesn't end on a pleasant note. While we were working on the ship, I lost my stepfather. And the reason why I bring this up was I lost the time to be with him. Um, he passed away after we finished the ship, and I didn't see him for three months. But all of this, all this speaking of the difficult years, all this act of finding flow, that's what helped me heal through the process. When I was destroyed, I reset and reestablished my motives, my goals, my desires, and it was calming. And this is what we're building next. 70 feet tall, made of wood, seven stories. There are two giant people in an embrace. It's a memory. And I want to leave you with a quote. This is a quote from Margaret Mead. And she says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We are in the future. That thing that we've all spoke about for 50 years now, that's here. We have all the tools, resources, talent, and collaborators available for any one of us to do whatever we dream of. So what will you do? Thank you.